Well, hello there. I'm Kim Dodsworth, Queensland Storyteller. Now, the Review Magazine of the Weekend Australian Newspaper is a much-awaited and highly relished item at our place. Covering as it does the arts and literary scene, each issue generally lasts us the full week until the next one appears. For a newspaper, its longevity is exceptional, particularly when contrasted with its siblings, general news, international news, business, sport, and so on. These always hit the recycle bin in short order, but not the review. Bedside or by the dining table, the review is a reading resource as addictive as cups of tea. A highlight of this excellent journal is the weekly column under the heading, This Life. Submitted by the great Australian public and carefully vetted by the paper's editors, it's always well-written, compelling, entertaining and often tear-inducing. Here are two recent samples. Story 1. This Thankful Life by Alan Smith The little girl looked like a doll, about three years old, with flawless skin, big eyes, and a pretty dress. But this doll's eyes were shut, and one of her legs was at an impossible angle. There was blood on her clothing, and she lay unmoving on the wet road. My memories of that day are mostly fragmented and stark, like cartoon panels with huge narrative gaps between them. But I recall with absolute clarity the abrupt, angry tire screech followed by the strangely delicate, dull thud of an impact. Then it seemed at the time from my pavement vantage point, there was only silence. My entire consciousness was gripped by the sight of the mother's face, contorted in horror, pain and fear. Although she was undoubtedly screaming, I could hear nothing of it. Then I was kneeling at the girl's side, utterly helpless, utterly useless. I saw my wife running down the busy road with a stranger, away from the accident. Later, I heard how the two of them had flagged down oncoming traffic, diverting it up a side road. Then out of nowhere appeared another man, kneeling like me at the girl's side, apparently a doctor. His authority and competence was obvious. At some point, he either asked me for or I volunteered my coat to cover the child. It seemed like only seconds, but it must have been several minutes before we heard the welcome siren of an ambulance. Medics and equipment and movement all merged into one. Then it was over and my wife and I went home. Neither of us felt like completing our morning coffee and croissant stroll. What we had just seen was in itself sufficient to dampen our spirits. But that effect was amplified many times over by the fact we had two daughters and two grandchildren. One of those daughters and one of those grandchildren were of ages very similar to those of the mother and child we had just seen taken away. There was no need for either of us to voice the inevitable comparison. We could each tell without asking what the other was thinking. For a few days afterwards, I searched the newspapers to see if it was mentioned. It wasn't. Too minor an accident to warrant the space, I supposed, and stopped searching. Then a couple of weeks later came a knock on the door, and there was the same mother, this time with a man. No contorted face or fear now, but a tired, quiet, Middle Eastern beauty. She spoke no English, but he did. He handed back my old coat, plastic wrapped and dry cleaned. A previously paid power bill returned to the side pocket. She gave me a smile and a tin of biscuits she'd baked. They both gave me their thanks and told me their names and the name of their child, but little registered as I retreated into platitudes and inanities. They said the child was now out of hospital and would in time be fully well. Then they were gone. Two memories of the visit remained vividly drawn. The warmth of the woman's hand, more a caress than a handshake, and her jaw-dropping beauty, not merely of features, but of self-contained bearing. Their shared, quiet dignity was in sharp contrast with my clumsy mumblings. Perhaps they left under the impression their child had been kept warm by the coat of the village idiot. It hardly mattered, of course. What really mattered was that their world, so recently on the brink of collapsing, seemed to be returning to normal. 
Story 2, This Struggling Life by Thomas A. Mullins It was long ago and far away in Dublin. The world was poorer than today, and I have a memory almost as old as me. He would stand me on a common chair in the scullery and tie my shoelaces. When one was done, this man of few words would tap the back of my leg to bring the other one forward. And when that one was done, he would pull my shirt down inside my short pants. I have other memories, seeing him sowing potatoes or weeding in the garden, standing over a basin of water, testing a bicycle tube for a puncture. The upturned bicycle nearby, carrying me by crossbar to stony batter, telling me to blow my nose in the rain-washed gutter or cycling to Croke Park on a Sunday and lifting me over a stile. An autumn walk in the Phoenix Park, a winter walk to Ashtown. That given time could never be outdone by all the comfort of the years to come. My father grew a hard shell to hide his humanity. Back in the day, for men to show emotion, it was thought to be a sign of weakness. He showed no weakness. His world simply did not allow it. I remember him in a brown shop coat, standing over a last, working the leather with hard calloused hands. He turned shoe repairs into half crowns to feed, clothe and educate his growing family. Take those shoes around to Mrs. Crow and don't leave them without the half crown, my mother would say. The hungry years, though I never remember being hungry. The recipe, tea and bread, threepence worth of pot herbs, a penny worth of thyme. Among her many qualities, my mother had the remarkably easy facility to aggravate a saint. My father was not a saint. I think of them now as two tectonic plates, constantly grinding against each other, sometimes with seismic effect. I'll never know how or have his courage, but he endured. In a dysfunctional world, he functioned. Got up every working day, organized his children, sorted their schooling, and, in my memory, was never sick. After I followed John, the eldest, into the employ of Guinness, I remember being puzzled when he looked at me, not so much with disdain as with despair. I was bookish, liked poetry and played tennis, in whites. I was as straight as he was, but I now believe he thought he had raised another wild without the talent of Oscar. He gave me his name when I was born. I gave him a headstone when he died, far, far too young, at 56. When I was 18 and needed a driving license to launch my commercial career and validate my leaving Guinness, he gave me his. In my memory, he never drove a car. How many go to sit their driving test with the vital permit already inside their jacket pocket? For me, it meant a license to drive the boulevard of dreams while he continued to cycle the wet, cobbled or black, icy streets of Dublin. When I received the news that number 225, where I was born, had been rendered to the sum of its parts, my sister, now the custodian of its ghosts, I looked out over the wide Pacific and thought of battles long ago. The half-crown tug-of-war with Mrs. Crow. How could a child of barely ten summers guess that one day the leaden grey skies of 1950s Dublin would give way to a shower of 21st century gold? I just had to live a lifetime, know the burden, infinitely lighter, of rearing my own children and get to appreciate the grinding effort of his labour. He gave to the world nine witnesses to his unequal struggle in that strumpet city far from the fatal shore. And you've been listening to two items from the Review Magazine of the Weekend Australian Newspaper. The first was This Thankful Life by Alan Smith, and the second, The Struggling Life by Thomas A. Mullins. I'm Kim Dosworth, and I'm looking forward to meeting with you again this time next week when there'll be more writing of quality for your enjoyment.